This is the student success plan at Sinclair Community College. This is an open source project, but it has its genesis at a community college trying to really deal with the challenges and issues around student success, retention, and completion. So I'm going to take you through today, talk about what is in the open source software and what is available to you now and what will be available to you in the very near future. So what is the student success plan? It's an open source software system really around student success, retention, and completion. It allows us to bring a lot of things together. You have to think of SSP as an umbrella. It encompasses many different tools and provides a common platform for those tools to work together so that we can tackle a lot of different kinds of things that historically we might have done as separate, individual, unique technology solutions. And it includes case management software, academic advising tools, which are typically referred to as MAP or My Academic Plan, early alert and the ability for your faculty to participate, a student interface so students can see the tasks that they need to accomplish, their academic plan, do some self-help, and also be able to drive their scheduling process. It does integrate with your student information system to make sure that we're not duplicating data and to put as much information at the fingertips of our coaches, counselors, and advisors as possible so they can spend more time coaching and less time hunting for data. And then ultimately, we're going to want to know, did the things we did, did the interventions we took, did the programs we set up actually accomplish what we set out to do? Did they increase retention? Did they help us actually succeed with students? And can we measure that? And so the reporting and data collection is very important. And you're going to see a lot of canned reports that are available in the system. And since it is open source and you have access to the data, you could access it in any way you like. And your IR part departments can go crazy with being able to pull out information and be able to help you understand, are the processes that we're putting in place actually having the impacts that we wanted to? So why do people do this? Over time, most people are around success and retention. I'm probably preaching to the choir if you've already joined up for the webinar for that. I think we're all after better graduation rates. The ability to have systematic and comprehensive advising and counseling and intervention processes, particularly for those of you with distributed environments with multiple campuses or online programs, where the student may go to campus A and then when they go to campus B experience a different advising or coaching process and being able to wrap our hands around that and come up with an idea of what is common, what is consistent, do we really know what is happening at each of these locations and then how do we manage that so that we can improve that. Most people are after the ability to implement an early alert intervention process, typically having faculty or other support staff in the college be able to drive the process of bringing support interventions to bear for a student. The faculty are our boots on the ground in the classrooms with the students or online with those students and they're most likely to notice that there might be something amiss and that we could do something better to help them. We believe in the idea of creating a knowledge base, referral sources, so we want to collect the great work that you have done with your counselors, coaches, and advisors and instead of having those people redo that work all the time, we collect that in one knowledge base we call the reference guide and then be able to use that with our students each time we interact with them and also for the students to use it in a self-help fashion. We really want to break down silos particularly between faculty and chairs and students and coaches and advisors and the registrar and financial aid etc. So we don't want students to feel like they're pinballing around our organization. We want them to feel like the organization knows what their goals are and it's trying to help the student achieve those goals. We do want the students to be able to do some self-help we all know that providing more time and interaction on a one-on-one -on -one basis with a student will help them be successful, but that doesn't scale tremendously well. And so we want to create the ability to use technology in a way that takes the good work and effort done by coaches, counselors, and advisors and allows us to scale that so students can take advantage of it themselves and be able to provide themselves some, some services. And then ultimately, and probably the number one feature of the entire system, is that we want to create clear plans of actions for students. This could be in terms of the academic plan or the specific services plans. What do they need to do to be successful? How do they get the services or support or meetings or whatever it might be that's going to make them successful in college? How do they know which classes to take in what term and what modality? And how can we help document that? and then track their progress so that we know what they need to do and they know what they need to do and that we can all help them get there. So why should you all listen to my webinar this afternoon and take an hour of your precious time to look at this? We have done a lot of research and we're getting research in from other folks as well now. And at Sinclair, because of the funding started way back in the day, in 2003, we got a Title III grant and I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
But because of that, we've been keeping longitudinal data over a very long period of time, and we feel very confident to say that the system does have an impact on student success. St. Petersburg, who implemented the system last fall, is already showing some uptick in their student retention and success. And we have a recently produced paper by Gateway to College National Network, and there's the link on the page, that provides a great framework and talks about how all the different technology pieces are grounded in the literature and goes back to where in engagement theory or in support services, et cetera, that all of these tools are applied and how they might be used. And then also creates a nice framework for how you might measure those and how the technology can assist you in that process. So some evidence of impact at Sinclair, and this is specifically at Sinclair, and the group I'm going to talk about is really our most at-risk population. These are going to be our students that were academically unprepared for college, testing into two dev eds below the 100 level, so not ready as far as college math or college reading or English, or are in poverty, according to their documentation. So we know that these students historically do not succeed as well as their peers, and so we have singled them out in a process at Sinclair we call Pathways to Completion. And with that, we provide an intrusive counseling and mentoring process using the student success plan as our tool to do that. Now, we manage many other populations at the college, but this is the one I have the best data for and over that 10-year period. So that's where I'd like to start. So we do know that they are more likely to successfully complete their courses, have higher first-term success rates, more likely to return, and more likely to graduate. Now, with that said, I would like to say that Technology is not magic. The people are magic. The counselors, the coaches, the advisors, the faculty, the chairs, those are the folks that the, make the magic happen with the student. The technology supports them. And so just implementing technology will not give you retention numbers like this overnight. It really allows you to build a process, refine that process, measure it, and go back and continue that over and over till you get to the place where you feel like you have the best solution possible for your students. Now with that said, we are able to have an impact that we feel very proud about as far as having a 37% higher rate of retention for these most at risk students. And those students then succeed at 26% higher rate of retention than the students not designated at risk. So these are students that tested into two dev eds or are in poverty, succeeding at levels higher than their peers that were already academically prepared. We also see near parity in our minority populations, which is something that makes us very pleased as well. Ultimately, this is probably what we're all here for and what we're all working toward to achieve is really driving completion. And we do have good data now to show that this kind of process combined with the technology does allow us to move the needle on graduation rates and that for these specific populations, we're seeing as much as five times higher graduation rate within six years. Now, obviously six years is way too long and is not what we're measured on, especially in the community college space, but it does show that these are students who received a credential instead of not receiving a credential. And that to us is the most important thing in our mission at a community college. And we feel like that the process works. Now we can just tighten it up and try to push that number of years back so that we can get more completion more quickly. I am the uh, SSP evangelist, so to speak, and it, I'm paid to be excited about this, and I've been working on it a decade, and it would be odd if I were not excited about it. But to show that it's not just Russ who thinks it's nifty, there are a lot of other folks out there who have taken the time and been kind enough to recognize that we've done some interesting work, and thought I'd share that with you, and these are both in terms of technology and process. So the software is open source, and it is no license cost. You can download it from our website for free, but it is free like a puppy, and that is why we have partnered with with folks like Unicon to be able to help folks wrap around all the services and support that they might need during an implementation of a new technology project. We have the SSP Open Source 1.2 is available today and has been available in production for quite some time. The SSP Beta 2 is currently in a limited beta in North Carolina, and the Beta 3, which will be out in just a few weeks in mid-July, will be an open beta uh, open to the public and to any other schools that wish to participate. So the current status as a project, as Lisa mentioned in the intro, we are part of the Aperio Foundation, which was formerly JSIG. JSIG and Sakai merged to become Aperio. So we are a very active project. As far as we know, we are the most active project in the foundation at this point in time. We have a dedicated project director, myself, and a product manager, Jason Elwood, and an architect, Dan McCollum. And Dan is actually at Unicon, so we have a very strong relationship with them in terms of technology. We have a number of active developers on the project. Our documentation is up to date. This is kind of a, a big deal when you look at an open source project. Are people actually keeping it up to date? Is there an active community? And is there training material? Is there documentation? Is there installation material? Sometimes open source projects fall down because very smart technology people create great technology, but then you don't have all the pieces around that. And I think that's something that we've worked really hard to make sure there is good install documentation, 
good training documentation, good research documentation, and good end user documentation so that they understand why we're doing this as well as how to do it. We have a number of uh, implementations in place, including College of Lake County, St. Petersburg, Indian River, and a number of others, and we have a number underway. So what's next? The project was additionally funded for another 1.5 million about seven or eight months ago, and we are funded until November 1st of 2014 to continue this full-time push. So uh, I personally will be working on the project full-time until then. We are in the process right now with Unicon as a partner, as well as Gateway to College. Talk about them in a second. With five colleges in North Carolina, there will be a three additional colleges. I believe some of you folks from uh, Stanley are on the line. There are three additional schools there for what was called IPASS, Integrated Planning and Advising Solutions. And then additional Ohio Completion by Design colleges will be joining. And then we have a number of other schools and folks running the legacy SSP system before we open source that will also be joining us. The SSP 2.0 will be in full production by fall. And then, like I said, we are funded until 2014 and we will continue to develop and improve the platform over that time. So these are our partners and funders and supporters. The Next Generation Learning Challenges, which is administered by Educause, is my grant funder, and they are provided their financing by the Hewlett Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Educause and the League for Innovation together manage the Next Generation Learning Challenges initiative, and the grant is run here at Sinclair Community College. Founding funding came from the Department of Education, like I said, Title III money starting in 2003 and running till 2008. We are working with Aperio as our agent and our foundation that supports us. And then Unicon on the technology side, and then Gateway to College National Network, a nonprofit out of Portland, Oregon, that helps us with the process and kind of consulting side. And then we are also tightly connected with Completion by Design. Sinclair is a uh, member of the Completion by Design program, as well as the leader of the state cadre in Ohio. We're also working with PAR, which is around predictive analytics and reporting, and the Community College Research Center out of uh, Teachers College Columbia. So how does the whole thing work? SSP in itself is not a screening instrument. It doesn't magically pick out that a student needs services. It's really the tool that helps us deal with, now what? We've identified that a student needs some kind of service, intervention, or help, and how do we deal with that? How do we track that? How do we manage it? And then how do we measure it ultimately? So you can use any kind of diagnostic tool, predict model, or demographic things, and figure out how you want to attack these populations. In our case, we've decided that being academically unprepared or in poverty is a key indicator for us that we want to really address those students as being at risk. We do have a student intake tool built into the system, which we'll cover briefly, which will allow you to collect a lot more data and demographics about these students than your registrar might, and provide you a lot more insight and understanding in who the students are and how to best serve them. So once we've identified students, we provide them kind of a holistic coaching, counseling, and advising, and we do that through tools such as the journal, creating an individual plan of action for that student and an individual academic plan for that student. Then we support them by having faculty send early alerts if they feel those students are not succeeding. And then also providing the students with self-help tools so they can return and see their plans of action or go through and just search for resources on their own that maybe they have not identified to us. That also works with the larger student population that we may not have targeted. They can benefit from the same referrals that those at-risk students can. and we're scaling up so we can have more impact with more students across the campus. So we're gonna start with case management. And while I'm gonna talk about this from how we use it and how we have seen it used, it is an a la carte system and you can pick and choose the pieces that are most relevant to you. By no means do you have to use a specific piece of the system, but we try to build the, the system in a way that will allow you to have the largest wraparound services for a student as possible. And we feel that that gives it the greatest impact. However, discrete elements of the system are quite handy and useful on their own. So we're gonna talk about the case management interface. And if you were to start off the day as a coach or an advisor or counselor, you would come in and you would see your students on the left-hand side listed, and they are color-coded. So students that need immediate assistance for an early alert would be a different color, and you would see how many alerts they have. You can also see what kinds of students they are. You would be able to see their IDs, etc. As soon as you select one of those students, out to the right, you're going to get a lot of information. And this is really the case management or the main dashboard. So on the left, we select the student. In that center column where it says tools, we're going to pick a tool. In this case, it's main. And out to the right, we're going to see the information that is associated with that student. So in this place, Amanda Adkins, we can see a lot of information about her. We can see what type of student she is, if she's active or not. We can see her academic advising plan, if she's following that advising plan. We can see who her academic advisor is. If it differs from her coach, it might or might not. We can see her academic program. 
We can see her GPA, what kind of academic standing she's in, or if there are any restrictions. We can see if she's registered or paid for the next few terms, if her financial aid has been awarded, if she's on satisfactory academic progress for financial aid, if she's an F1 student, and then we can also see if there are early alerts or action plan items open for this student. And then out to the right, we can see the different reasons for service and service groups. And these are highly configurable and will be unique to each college and each process that you want to track, but will give you a lot of latitude later to cut the data up and be able to track out on, I'd like to know about my completion by design fall 13 cohort that came in for developmental placement and what services did we give them so that we can study, did those students uh, benefit from those services? Did we really have the impact we wanted to have? As we detail into the record, it will enlarge on the screen so that we can see more about this student. Again, the same thing, but we can just see it in, in greater detail. And across the top there, you can see that the main tool has a dashboard, details, transcript, placement, contact, coach, and schedule. And we're gonna go through each of those. You can also see that on every screen, you're gonna see the student's name, ID, their coach assignment, and the ability to pull what's called the coaching history. That's going to give you a history of everything that's been done with this student in reverse chronological order so that you can quickly come up to speed and see who's been working with the student, what have they been doing, so that we can all work together and not work at cross purposes. So in the details tab, we have very similar information to the dashboard, but we just couldn't fit it all on one page. So <laughs> this allows us to go into more detail and provide more information for you about this student, particularly picking up things like gender, marital status, ethnicity, race, uh, intended program at admit, residency statuses, and then recent term activity. So the GPA of a 2.1 may be a fantastic thing or it may be a bad thing and you need context to know did the student have a 4.0 last term and has a 2.1 this term or did they have a 1.6 last term and a 2.1 this term. Very different kinds of situations and very different kind of focus from an advising or counseling perspective. So that recent term activity would show you the most recent terms on record if they were on or off their academic plan what their GPA was in that term, and what their load was in terms of hours. So you can say, is this a returning student? Is this a transient student? Is this a student who stopped out and come back? Did they drop from full-time to part-time or increase from part-time to full-time, etc.? So it's a lot of context in a very short amount of space without having to go to the transcript and try to decipher that. Also here we pick up the financial aid GPA so that you can have a separate one from your institutional GPA and hours earned, hours attempted, and a completion rate. Very important again from a financial aid perspective in SAP, bringing in the ability to look at transfer hours separately and have an actual balance for this student, financial aid amounts and award, and also loan amounts if you would like to bring this data in. Again, this stuff is not required. It is determined by you what you want to provide and then from a security perspective who you want to see this information. The next tab would be the transcript tab, and it does exactly what it sounds like. It brings in a transcript of the student, and it's going to show us if this is institutional credit, transfer credit, proficiency credit, all of that, and it's going to give us grades and terms, and we can sort this up and down so that we can look for courses and understand where this student is in their, in their process. Placement can be used for all the placement test scores for AccuPlace or Compass, ACT, SAT, as well as other things like the Myers-Briggs or the Lassie or the CSI from the Levitz or the Smarter Measures Instrument to be able to bring that information in and attach it to the student's record so that we can quickly understand where is this student sitting and where are they at. We've also looked at, and with North Carolina schools, we'll be bringing in which class they actually tested into. So a specific AccuPlace or score corresponds to a specific math class and we can go ahead and pull that information into this screen so that you quickly know that they are in DevEd Math 096 instead of DevEd Math 094. The contact screen, basically we just moved the address off of the main dashboard in details. We find that a lot of SISs include these, but when you talk to coaches and counselors, they don't really use the student's physical address very often. And so we went ahead and put this in a, in a less prominent place. We also have the concept of an alternate address, really for distance learning programs. So if the student goes TDY for six weeks and you still need to help them get a test proctor or make sure that materials get mailed to them in the right place without changing the residency status in your student information system. The coach tool is gonna to let you know who this student is assigned to, what the last service provided that student was, and all of the people or coaches that have worked with this student. So if this student had worked with somebody at South Campus yesterday and East Campus last week, we would see those entered below and we could get a quick idea that this student is moving from office to office or campus to campus. And again, gives us an opportunity to try to coordinate and make sure this student doesn't feel like that they're bouncing or pinballing around our institutions. 
The schedule would allow you to see particularly what was taken last term, current term, and next term, and just an insight so that you have that at your fingertips so that you can help them from an advising perspective. All of this information is typically available to coaches and advisors, and so it's not particularly unique in that regard, but what we've tried to do is bring it all together and put it in one place to make it easy to find, easy to navigate, so that you can spend more time coaching and less time hunting. So on to the next tool, the ability to create a note or an entry about a student. We call that the journal. And in the journal, we've implemented something we call speed notes. We want electronic record keeping to be faster than doing it by hand. When we open the journal, you can see a list of all the items that have been journaled for this student at the top. And if we were to say add, at the bottom we get an input screen. And we have a date, a confidentiality level, a source, and a comment. And that's all that is required to have a journal entry. The confidentiality level allows you to determine who will be able to see this comment later. And that's how we keep disability services, counseling services, academic advising, and faculty advising all in the same system without violating the student's privacy. Determining on that confidentiality level, the other people will just simply not see that that information exists in the system. The speed notes concept, how do we do this stuff fast? How do we give ourselves some process, some checklists, and take advantage of this. So out to the right, you can see a little drop down that says track, step, detail. And so for a specific type of process or a specific type of students, you can have track, steps, and details that are pre-populated, pre-filled with all of the kinds of notes that you might keep about. So that quickly you can go click on session two and then just click off the items that you would typically do in session two, hit save, and now that note will be entered with all the information about session two. This is completely configurable and you do not need IT to set this up. This will be managed by a power user in your group so that you can control these steps and details. And it's also going to give you a lot of flexibility later when you want to report back out about where is my student in a process. Are they on step two, step seven, a milestone three, whatever you want to call them so that you can come back and track those students and again use the demographic data we had on that first screen and what special service groups and reasons for service combined with what kinds of services did they receive that we've journaled and start really drilling down and understanding are we having the impacts we thought we would. The coaching history at any time can be opened and you can see an example of a journal entry. So it's going to show us who created the entry, the confidentiality level, the session type, and in this one it's called advising standard, and they check the boxes for develop and review a map review student strength, review their career goals, and create an action plan. So we know quickly what happened in that session. The second one is just a input that was done really fast. So they put in their details, or they just put in a comment and hit save. So it wasn't from a session site or detail, but immediately we can still just take any note you want. So it's not tried to be shoehorn you into one process, but to try to make life easier if you already have a defined process that you can kind of follow along. That's really nice too if you're onboarding a brand new coach or counselor that they can go through that list and see all the things that were really expected in session two, session three, session four, five, etc. Or in intake or in transfer or whatever the process is because those steps are already predefined as checkboxes. They can kind of see that that was the expectation and know that they need to go through that list. Again, it's not truly prescriptive, but it is a nice reminder and it does give us a little more structure and consistency between different groups different campuses to make sure that we're offering the same services to students. So the action plan is where we become more tactical and actually try to solve a student's problem. So maybe a student has presented and they say, I've got a real problem with uh, affording college or wow, I, I don't have a car, I can't get to college. I don't have childcare, so I'm not going to be able to make it into my classes. What are the kinds of things we typically would call these, say, non-cognitive issues that keep a student from being successful in a classroom? However, action plan items can be totally around cognitive issues as well, such as making sure a student gets to tutoring, that they go and go through a, a workshop on how to deal with math anxiety or, or things of that nature. So we're going to start identifying the challenges that a student has and creating steps or plans to get them through those challenges. So the first thing is, is we return to that counseling reference guide I talked about. This is that giant knowledge base of all the great work you have done and recorded around all sorts of different issues that a student might have. In this case, you can see a list there. This is going to be completely customizable and unique to your institution and will contain your referrals. We will give you an example to work from, but it's going to grow and be a living document that is what is available today to best help our students and what can I go out here and click on mm, childcare and see what kind of options are available right now for me to help this student. Again, we're not trying to, to shoehorn you in here and you can at any time just put in an open free form action plan item. 
The idea is that as you mouse over these, you will see all the information already pre-filled. And when you select one, it's going to automatically add that to the action plan item. If you would like to add to that in the description, you can feel free to do so. There can be a specific link accompanying it. And again, you can have action plan items that are of different confidentiality levels. So maybe one action plan uh, contains things that might be more of a counseling nature, and another action plan contains things that might be more of an advising nature. And we can separate those out so that the advisors may not be aware of the referrals that might be made from a counseling or disability services type of level. The idea, though, is to bring all those great works, again, some of that consistency. And if somebody's already spent a, a tremendous amount of time figuring out how to help a student that has a child with a disability find childcare in the evening. Everybody else shouldn't have to repeat that work. How can we put that in there? And then ultimately, how can we leverage that out so that the rest of the student body could also take advantage of that? So we use those action plan items to create an action plan for this unique student. These are the things that you need to go away and do to be successful. And then we actually list those out. We remind them of their goals, their strengths, and then we list the challenges with all of the information and we create a target date. We set an expectation. I'd really like you to have this done by next Wednesday, which makes the students much more likely to complete the task on a given time schedule. And then we sign it and they sign it. That's entirely up to you. The footers and headers are completely configurable in the system. We just find that when students sign things that they take them more seriously. So we give this to the student in printed form when we have them in our offices. We email it to the student as well. And then the student will have a self-help interface where they can go back and see these items at any time and also check them off and let them know that we've, they've completed them so that they might not have to return to the office or make a phone call. They might be able to take care of that online if they have access to a computer. We do have ability in the system to bring forward remarks or notes from other systems. So if you already have some legacy tools out there and you don't want to have to give them up entirely, you can bring the data forward. You wouldn't be editing that data, but it would allow us to display it. In this case, I'm showing the example of Aleutian's colleague from their STRK screen, which is student remark, which allows us to see the remarks that were made about this student years ago. So in some cases, back to 97, uh, 2001, 2008, etc. So that we're not losing that great historical record we've had. We're just bringing it forward into this tool so that we can still continue to leverage it. But honoring that goal that the coaches and advisors said is, I don't want to have to go and hunt for this in three or four places. Please make this easy so I can spend more time with my students. The student intake, once we've identified a student, and that whole dashboard and all those tools are really about how do we get information about the student that we already have, that the registrar has, their GPAs, their grade points, their payment statuses, their transcripts, all that kind of good stuff. Now, how do we collect more from the student that we don't currently have? And we have a student intake process. And you can do this with the student in your office, or you can send the student an email from the system that'll say, have the student fill out the student intake online. And they will get the self-help interface, and they can come and fill this form out on their own. And it looks a little different for them. But when it comes back, you get a lot of demographic information that you might not have in your registration system, such as veteran status, military affiliations, which country that they're from, if they're an F1 student, if they're a primary caregiver. If so, how many children or people are they caring for? What are their ages? Do they need child care? And if so, what kind of child care? Uh, are they employed? What shift do they work, etc.? What are their plans? What currently do they have as educational levels? Did their parents attend college? What are their goals? What are their sources of funding? And much of this is configurable because what you have and what we have at our institution are gonna be different things. But a funding question might just start a conversation. I see here that you're gonna self-fund and your employer is gonna help you. What is the paperwork process that your employer needs so that we can make sure that you get money? Because maybe the student doesn't understand that they're going to have to submit verification before the term and after the term, et cetera. And maybe this kicks off a process to help make sure that they get the resources that they're entitled to. The last would be the challenges screen, again, entirely configurable and unique to your institution, but it allow you to collect what you know about that student. And if they've already identified that they have a challenge with childcare or transportation, that you can have some ideas for the action plan before they even show up in your office the first time. We do have a tool in the system to deal with disability services. I've mentioned several times. Ultimately, it boils down to what accommodations are we making and how do we document those, and then ultimately how we'll communicate those to other members of the institution to make sure the student gets the resources they need. So moving on to the academic advising piece. From academic advising, we've got a couple major questions that we were dealing with when we built this tool. So how do we know what students need to do? And when I say we, I don't mean advising. I mean the institution. 
How does everybody at the institution know what a specific student needs to do? How do students know what they need to do? We've got tools like Degree Audit, and this in no way, shape, or form is a Degree Audit tool. It is about documenting the interactions between a student and their advisor and being able to drive value from that. Degree Audit will kick out, take nine hours of humanities and seven hours of science, and does that really tell them what they need to do? Or it tells them kind of algebraically what they're missing? not what they need to take next fall, what's going to be offered distance learning because they're not going to be in town, or how they're going to get through this as an individual. So once we've helped them plan that out, and that's what they come to advisors for, right, is help, and how do I get through this? And then how do we know that they've done that? <laughs> Will they do what we tell them to do? And how can we work to make sure that that happens? On the bottom, we've got those three smaller questions. Will they remember to do what we told them? How can we help them make the right decisions? I'm sure those of you in the audience that are advisors have had an experience where you, you've told a student something and they've done something entirely different and, and you don't find out about that for some amount of time and then it's frustrating and trying to figure that out and try to understand what's going on. And then ultimately as well, are we offering the courses that we told students to take? So there's frequently a disconnect between what advising tells students to do and what the academic side offers us courses. And we try to deal with this in higher ed and with things like planning guides and making sure that we're going to say, we guarantee that this class will be taught in the fall. But that is different than saying, what did advising tell 300 students to do? And if we had the data about what the students were advised to do, could we use that to offer the classes that the students actually need? not the students that we want to offer or classes we want to offer in fall. And so this data becomes very instructional to help us understand that 327 students were advised to take accounting, but we're currently only showing a capacity of 200. Maybe we need to do something about that because accounting was in the planning guide. But that doesn't mean that we've always collected data about what was actually advised and rectified that with what we actually offer. So we want to create a clear individual academic plan for each student. Like I said, it's not a degree audit. It is a plan. We want to move forward. The plans can include things that would, a degree audit would never even understand or, or know about. You know, job training, skills training, the fact that you're going to transfer to another institution and you need a specific class that wouldn't be on a standard degree audit, etc. We like to be very prescriptive in our environment. This is a philosophical thing, not a technical thing. But we want to be prescriptive but not stringent, and you'll see how this plays out in the system itself. We want to remind the student and everybody who works with the student what the path is at every opportunity. So at Sinclair, for example, the student's academic plan is available to all their faculty members straight off of their rosters. That would use one of the APIs available in the open source software. But we show them if the student is on or off plan and what classes they're taking and who their advisor is so that we can shortcut problems like who on earth told you to take this class that students might get in a classroom setting so that we can begin to take that answer from the brown haired lady told me to take it to what is actually happening and when the faculty member becomes engaged can see the entire plan maybe they understand there isn't a challenge or maybe they understand there is but now we have a chance to fix that problem instead of just having angst about that problem. So ultimately we want to be able to take action. If the students aren't doing what we advise them to do, why? And should we be able to reach out and offer them more services? And the default path should always lead to success. So Dr. K. McClenney, who's out at the University of Texas at Austin, in their higher ed program there, is famous for saying community college students don't do options. And we agree with that. And so what we try to do is prevent a student with all the default options in place, meaning that we no longer say take three hours of humanities anywhere on our plans. Again, this is a philosophical thing, not a technical thing. But what we want is for there to be a class there and then other options that are available. But we want to make sure that the class sitting out there for them to actually register for will lead them to success and that then they can move from there. So we're going to start back from that main caseload screen and down on the left hand side you can see that we've got all of our tools and that map is one of those tools. So in the map or my academic plan interface we've got kind of a couple things going on here. On the left in that vertical column where we have a big list of courses and above that we have a list of different filters. So if we start at the top, we have the ability to filter by program. And program in this term can mean anything you want it to mean. It could be filter by a transfer program, filter by a specific degree or certificate, or specific types of electives, whatever you want that program to say, certain job training tracks. But when you select it, it's going to list only the courses that are associated with that. Then you're going to have filter by tags. 
and tags can be anything you want them to be again. However, we're going to typically see those as like, show me all the distance learning courses. Show me all the courses that transfer to a specific institution. Show me all the courses that qualify for honor students. Show me all the courses that are delivered at our southern campus. And then last, filter by term. And this is really going back to your transfer guides. And it's dependent on your information. But if you know that you only want to advise a student to take a class that we're guaranteeing will be offered, we can filter the classes that way as well. So if we're hunting for a specific elective for a student in summer, we only want to look for the classes that we know are going to actually be offered in the summer. As we go over the courses in that list, you could double click on them and it would actually show you a course description. It would show you the co-recs, the pre-recs, the men, the max hours, and kind of information that you have loaded from behind the scenes and about that course. It would also show you all the tags so that you would know that this is a transfer course or this is a, a distance learning course, etc. There's also a free form filter by, so you could just type in there DEV or math or accounting and it would get all those courses as well. So a lot of different ways for advisors to filter down the courses and find them quickly and be able to pull them in for a student. The interface is then simply drag and drop. You take from the source courses on the left and you drop it in a bucket on the right. And each one of those boxes represents a term and those term buckets are holders for each of those courses. So you can see that in the spring 2014 term, there's a COM 138, a COM 295, a History 126, etc. And listed down there is also a Psych 127, and there's a little HUM next to it, showing that in this program, that this Psych course is being used as a humanities. So the color coding out to the left of each of those courses, the orange courses mean that this course is important. The color coding right next to Psych means that this is the color that is associated with humanities electives next term over in summer where there's a little yellow stripe, this would mean that this course is already transcripted, meaning the student already has credit. So if you drag it out here, this is a warning to you that this student may not need this course. Or this can also be the checklist when you return to the student record to make sure that they have completed the credit for each one of these. As we go out to the fall term in 2014, you can see that there are different colors for program electives or gen ed electives, etc. And you can determine all of those. So if you already have a color scheme at your institution for those, you can make it match. As you bring courses into each term, you're going to get a running credit hour total. And then at the top, you're going to get a running total for the entire plan, as well as a separation for dev ed credits, since we know they're not going to apply toward graduation. If you double click on a course while we're in the plan itself, Actually, here's an example of the filtering. So if we'd picked Associates of Arts and Communication and Transfer and drilled down to that, if we double click on a course in a plan, we're going to see that we have the ability to create notes. Advisors love their notes on their pieces of paper that they've historically given to students, and we want to honor that entirely. So at the course level, the term level, and the plan level, there is the ability to create notes. And there are two kinds of notes. There are advisor notes that only other advisors will see, and there are student notes that only the student will see. So that way we can communicate different things to different populations. When another advisor looks at this plan, what do they need to know? And when the student looks at it in their shopping cart, what do they need to know? We can also see that that is where we would mark this as important, so it would turn orange, or select that it's a certain kind of elective so that we could get the other color coding and naming schemes to know how this course is being used in this term. This would be all well and good. We could drag and drop as many courses in as we want, and that would help us document things. But this also leaves something to be desired in terms of speed. So what we really want to do is use a template. And you can have pre-created templates for all of your different programs. Your, you can have a template for part-time program, full-time program, for programs with and without dev ed, or however you define them. You go crazy with your templates. And the idea is that you would load a template, and you would have created that template in conjunction with the chair and the faculty and advising all together, picking out what are the best options, what are the best electives and why, and have a default best pathway. And then advising could start from there instead of starting from scratch. And then this saves a tremendous amount of time as they bring in all the courses and all the requirements for a specific engineering degree or a nursing degree or whatever it might be. And then they just tweak it to become unique for that individual student. Ultimately, there's a printout for both advising and for students. In this case, this is an advising printout, which should show you all the terms, all the courses, co-recs, prereqs, notes that were given to the student, notes that were given to the advisor, and whether or not credit was awarded for this term. The student version looks a little like this, and you can, you can customize it and make it pretty to your heart's content, but it's going to basically list all their courses, the credit hours, if it's awarded or not, if it was an elective, and if so, what kind, and then if there were any notes. So, for example, if you want to say, you know, you can take Mark 2225 or Mark 2145, that's fine as well. It's also going to list who their advisor is, and in the self-help interface, they could click that link and be able to communicate. 
So from an early alert perspective, how do we allow the folks, the faculty or the student government folks or ombudsman or student services or financial aid, somebody to tell us that a student needs assistance and how do we take care of that? So in this case, we're showing an example of a faculty member looking at a list of courses or students on their roster. So they have Physics 315 pulled up and they have a list of their students. This can also be fully integrated with your LMS. I know an integration has already been done with Angel and Sakai, and I believe Unicon would be happy to demo the Sakai integration where you can have the, the faculty do this straight from their LMS so that they don't have to have another system to go to. It's really pretty simple. Once they have a student selected, they fill in some very simplistic information. What campus are they on? Why are they making referral? Do they have any suggestions? Again, you're gonna configure all of those and they're gonna say send an early alert. We want this to be simple enough so that our adjuncts and part-timers will engage and do this with us and that we'll make sure that we get those students supported. They can also put in a free form comment. Now, when they hit send an early alert, they're gonna get a confirmation. They're gonna get the opportunity to notify the student or not notify the student. In some cases, the faculty do not want the student to know an alert was sent. In some cases they do, so that is their discretion. And then the case manager or early alert coordinator will get an email letting them know that action needs to be taken. In the interface, we wanna provide a feedback loop that is automated. We want faculty to always know that we have validated and are taking serious the fact that they have taken their time and energy to send us an alert. And so we want to do that without adding extra burden to the people doing the case management. So the simple act of opening that and saving the record again will automatically send an email back to the faculty member letting them know that we are working with the student. So we can document kind of uh, what was our outreach, what were the outcomes, and you can do this without violating the student's privacy because we could simply say, I am working with a student, thank you very much for your help. And that is what the faculty member would get, which will encourage them to send more alerts because they know that the time and effort they spent doing it was used and somebody's doing something about it, but at the same time without telling them anything about what's really going on in the student's life if it's not pertinent to share with them. Obviously, if it's academically related, you can share as little or as much as you want. So we have some student interfaces that are native. In this case, the what we call resources or my GPS, and they're gonna have some self-help guides, the ability to contact their coach, see their academic plan, and search for resources. You can see out there on the right, all those action plan items we created are immediately shown to them. These are the things you need to do to be successful and they have the ability to check those off and let us know that that is the case. They have the ability to print that out again and email it. That is also the same for the academic plan. So if they lose that piece of paper, they can come here and reprint it and re-email it at any time. These are some of our student interfaces that we've done based on the application programming interface that is provided with the open source software. So these are not part of the free like a puppy, but these are available to be done technically with your IT group or with Unicon. But the idea here is that in a portal, we would want to show all the tasks that they need to complete, their academic plan, and who their coaches are immediately on the front page so that they're reminded every time they log in, here are the steps you need to take to be successful, and here are the classes that you're going to take in the next term. At Sinclair, we're going to use this for all of our enrollment steps, so please get a student ID card, please attend orientation, please make sure your FAFSA is on file, etc. And we're going to do that from a system so that we don't have to do those by hand. We can also support mobile through that API so that we can list all their academic plan stuff on their mobile devices. This is an example of the one at Sinclair, as well as their task lists. And ultimately, everything that we've done up to this point from academic advising is really around trying to drive student behavior. We've documented everything, but why? Because we really want the students to take the classes that we've advised. So at Sinclair, through our API interfaces, we have checked in our registration tool where it will say, are you on or off plan? And if they're off plan, it will warn them that they should really see an advisor. And if they proceed, or if they weren't off plan, we're only going to search for the classes that they were advised to take. So instead of making them go hunt through our entire schedule and put in specific key words or numbers, we're going to say, these are the four classes you should take. And we're going to make the path of least resistance the one of success instead of the other way around. Then when they actually try to register, we're going to remind them that maybe what you're registering for does or doesn't match what you and your advisor talked about. So prescriptive, but not stringent, we will let them register for things that were not advised, but we want them to be informed consumers and to confirm that they really, really want to do that so that they understand that this is not taking them in the direction that they talked about with their advisor. So with all that said, we want to be able to collect data and be able to bring a lot of things back and understand what we did with the student and how that's impacted them, how it impacts our processes, how can we change, how can we iterate and get stronger and better and help more students be successful. So the reporting suite, there's 20 some canned reports currently in the, the releases that we're uh, putting out and they are allowed to be pivoted on all kinds of different kinds of criteria. So 
to a specific person, to a specific status, specific department, specific service reasons, groups, referral sources, their start terms, their anticipated start terms, etc. And all of them can be put out to CSV and taken straight into Excel or as a PDF file. A common one that, that makes people kind of happy, <laughs> especially the case managers that have to manage these populations, is what's called the counselor case management report. And so we can limit that to just ourselves and then just look at our students and want to find out things about them. And so I've pulled one of those reports in that you can see. And in this case, we're listing out the students, their IDs, phones, but then things like their type, status, academic standing, financial aid, cumulative GPA, their term GPA, their current registration status, the last term of attendance, their actual start dates, etc. And if they're any part of any special service groups. And then this can be filtered. And also, if you've ever had a report show up on your desk, and sometimes you've been like, well, how on earth did you get this data? At the top of all of our reports on the left, you can see all the different variables and criteria used, and also the date the report was run, and the count of the number of students generated, so that it's easy to go back and make sure that we're comparing apples to apples instead of apples to zebras, so that when we do our data analysis that we know that I made the same selection you made, uh, so that we can compare equivalently. So, Wrapping up our time today, I wanted to talk a little bit about the differences between what's out there and what will be out there. So SSP 1.2 contains all those items down the left that we've talked about today, the main tool, that student intake, the action plan, the journal, early alert, and the accommodation or disability services tool. The 2.0, beta 2, and beta 3 tools add a few details to the main tool, including the details, which gives us a little more information, and also the student schedule. They also add the external notes, so that we can bring in that data from legacy systems and the ability to attach documents, any kind of document scanned transcripts or ODS status documents from like Veterans Affairs or wherever it might be. And then the biggest feature that gets added in SSP 2.0 is MAP or My Academic Plan and the ability to do the academic advising. So SSP 2.0 Beta 2, like I said, is in being installed in North Carolina right now and we went down and did training last week and that is in place and we will have that kind of in a private beta and as soon as beta 3 comes out that will become public and folks can begin using that right away. That all notwithstanding there is no downside to installing 1.2 first and then updating to SSP2. The update process that we've created is non-destructive and so the updates are entirely additive. So the work you do installing SSP1.2 will not be negated when you have to reinstall SSP 2.0. It is really just additive. And the data integration and work you do to integrate and build a server will all be reused and not lost. So with that, I have come to the end of our time. And I thank you very much for your patience and spending your precious afternoon with me. And I would be happy to take any questions. And if you would like a demo or more detailed information on the technical side, Unicon's contact information is down there. And if you're interested about the project itself and kind of the direction and what we're trying to do from a, a philosophical perspective, my contact information is on there also, and I'd be happy to talk to you at any point in time. So thanks, folks. And now I'm going to turn to the chat window and see what we got. So will this system be able to integrate with Canvas? We've actually talked to the Canvas folks. We've talked to the Desire to Learn folks. We've talked to the Blackboard folks. My reaction would be yes. We've had no problem integrating with Angel or Sakai. It's just a matter of actually doing it. I don't have a Canvas integration to give you with the, the tool today. But as soon as somebody builds one, that's kind of the beauty of the open source is that we'll be able to help everybody else with that as well. So I can already give you the one for Angel or the one for Sakai. What is the size of the largest campus that is in SSP by number of students? Well, here at Sinclair, I'm sitting on about 25,000 students in a given fall and 40,000 unique students but I am not the biggest school. St. Pete, I believe, is the biggest school, and they're running more like 40,000 students. Can access to specific fields in the intake form be limited to certain staff faculty populations? And you mean that by after the fact so that we can look at certain information. The short answer is yes. The long answer is we would have to configure that to make sure that the security role has that appropriately defined so that the information in those is, is secured out that way. So slight customization but not not overly difficult can the system identify cohorts for mass communication purposes so it's absolutely can identify cohorts and we are working on a feature that we hope to have in beta 3 to be able to send an email to a group of folks that come out of one of those reports right now that it doesn't have a whole lot of communications management pieces for a big cohort like that it's really on an individual student basis what you could do though is track an entire population of students by cohort by term by special service group etc kick that out to csv and then do a mail merge for your mass communication which is how we've been doing them but we are working on doing an email directly from that reporting interface. I just 
don't want to promise you anything because it isn't actually in the system yet, but I expect it to be there by the end of July. Tracking people in cohorts is one of the strengths of the system. We can tag people in all kinds of different ways that are non-exclusive, meaning you can be part of the DL cohort as well as the nursing cohort, as well as a fall 13 start, et cetera, and then make multiple selects so that I just want my fall 13 nurses in distance learning to show up in this report, or I just want everybody in fall 13, et cetera. And that is one of the, the big powers of the system, as well as all of that speed notes so that I can say, show me the fall 13 nurses who were then involved with Pathways to Completion who completed the milestones in session two, three, and four. How long does full implementation usually take in terms of getting all as many as possible faculty and staff on board? So that really depends on how many of the tools you want to take on. And that's it's really more of a process challenge than a technical one. Tools like this, regardless if you pick SSP or any other kind of IPASS, integrated planning and advising system, are really about cultural change and, and having folks embrace them. I've seen some schools do this in very short order, meaning they go in, they install it, and they hit something very quickly. And the folks that have done that have typically picked one feature like early alert and implemented it really heavy across a huge population. So at St. Pete, they did a pilot and then they rolled it out pretty much to everybody. And they got traction pretty fast on that. Other folks are, you know, just, just going like, hey, we're going to do it with every incoming fall freshman. And some other folks are doing more like, hey, we have a grant and we have to track 500 people and we want to track them very carefully. So it really is more about your culture than it is about the technology piece. But I'd be happy to talk to you about that offline and, and talk about some of the cultural pieces of this. So how do you initiate early alert campaigns, like email faculty to tell them it is early alert time or what? So yeah, that's a business decision each college makes. At our time, at our place, we actually allow early alerting before the term, through the term, and after the end of the term. So we don't want to limit them to alert on a specific day. One of the reasons we did that is that if you have them all alert on the 10th day, then the folks that have to respond with alerts are drowned in alerts on the 10th day. It also creates an issue where if the student didn't buy their book and they show up to class the first day and they don't have a book and they show up the second day and they still don't have a book and you talk to them about it and they're not going to buy the book, etc., maybe we, st we need to get you assistance on the third day, not the 10th day. With that said, our early alert coordinator certainly does send out an email to all the faculty that should be doing alerts on regular intervals, reminding them about the kinds of things they should alert about at that point in time in the term. And that's really a business practice more than it is about the tool. Can we identify for the MAP systems which courses we should offer? You can certainly identify which courses have been advised to students to take. Quick anecdote I can share with that is that we had a chair step down and a new chair step up in a program, and that new chair came in and said, holy cow, we've never offered all these courses in summer before. I'm going to cancel all these classes. And that was a term and a half out, so he thought that was plenty good. And then he thought, you know, I, I know Russ was showing me that we could do something with that MAP tool. And so he called me up, and, and Bob said, hey, Bob, uh, Russ, uh, can you show me the students that I have advised in those classes? And I said, sure thing, Bob. And I showed him how to do that online. And he was able to find out there were 400 and some students in those specific courses advised to take them that summer, and including 50 some students in capstone classes that would not have been able to graduate. And we were able to then make a different decision. We are going to offer those classes. And then Bob was also able to take the lists of students from each of the classes that he did decide to cancel because he just didn't have the staffing. And he had somebody reach out from advising and actually re-advise those students to take other courses to keep them on track or create an independent studies, et cetera. So the experience for those students was very different than just making them upset. So something about STRK notes is this information imported from Banner. So in our case, STRK is actually a keyword from the colleague system, which is a Lucian or Datatel system. But any system that had external notes like that could be imported from Banner or PeopleSoft or whatever other system that you have notes in could be brought forward, yes. Can you do a degree check via MAP? Not exactly. So it is not a degree audit. It is not necessarily what the student is graduating against because a MAP could be just for the last two terms or for the fact that you want to take some new Java classes and update your skills. And so they don't always align with the degree audit exactly. So we still run our degree audits in the SIS, but we use these to document what was actually told to the student about how to complete the degree audit. You can track a student's progress because the map will continue to update on which credits were earned and not earned so that you can see where a student is, but it ultimately won't do an official degree audit. If you created a map in the first place that was equivalent to your degree audit, then that becomes semantic. So is a record in the system created once the intake form is completed or is it automatically in the system but needs to be activated by completing an intake form? 
can be either way. Some schools, St. Pete decided to put all their students in the system as soon as they became active and assign them to coaches automatically. Other folks add them to the system as needed. The process of adding them to the system requires one piece of information, their student ID. So the, the process is not terribly onerous to do at the time of service, and our program aides do it for our advisors and coaches when the student presents. The intake itself is not tied to their record being created. The intake is not required for any service to be delivered, so different processes can require that intake or not require that intake. So in some of our places, let's say if you're part of the honor students or whatever that are in the system, maybe you don't do the intake. But if you're part of our at-risk population, you do. It depends on your business need about whether or not the intake gets filled out. Could courses in MAP be tagged as planned courses and integrate with the degree audit system? Meaning if your degree audit system has the ability to import planned courses, yes. Meaning that you would take the, the MAP courses and they would be output to your degree audit system as the plan in the degree audit. I could conceive of that being done. I have not done that personally. Our system is not set up like that, but I do see that as being a, a, a potential way to do that. What we have not done though is tried to lock our plans to a degree audit. And, and I'll give you an example. Let's say a, a nursing student comes in, or a student wants to be a nurse, she's going to have to be on the waiting list a year and a half. And so we can't put her into the nursing program per se, and we no longer really have pre-nursing. But let's say this nurse wants to become a phlebotomist so that she can make more money, so that she can save money, quit her job, and then become a nurse full-time. Our degree audit system would have no way to cope with that, and it would appear that that student was way off track, that they were trying to do a short-term certificate that had nothing to do with the nursing degree, but in reality, that might be what advising has told her to do because that's what's best for her situation. So we are a little bit leery of tying this one-to-one -one because we realize that sometimes students need courses that aren't part of their degree track because of they're going to transfer to a specific institution or university and they need a course that doesn't fit our mold but does fit their goals. So does MAP recognize multiple degree programs a student is in? So that's, that's kind of what I was getting at. MAP will let you map anything. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't care that they're in three or four degree programs. You can map that out all at the same time, and that's what I was getting after. Degree audit doesn't really like that. It wants you to run a degree audit against each of those different degrees separately. But when it comes time for registration, what is the student working on? And so in MAP, we want to identify that the student should be taking a specific set of courses. And in our case, we could have one course from each of those degree tracks if that's what we advise the student to do. So it certainly will do that. Well, folks, I appreciate, oh, wait, have we done automatic sort of enrollment based on what's planned and mapped? So we do do that in the, the sense that we show the students only the courses that they should be taking. We don't auto enroll them. Could we? Probably technically. We have not been that prescriptive in saying that they may only take what we advise. I assume that that could be done from a technical perspective. What we do is we try to only show them the classes that we have advised, and then what they're really doing is picking the scheduling. So our advising and scheduling are kind of broken apart because advising may happen you know, months in advance of when scheduling becomes available for a student to know if they're going to take that in the day or the evening or Monday or Wednesday or Friday. So we just show them just the four courses that they need. And then we try to warn them, you're taking something that's outside of that. Could I take that a step further and be prescriptive and say you may only register for one of these four courses? Technically, yes, but from an institutional perspective, we are not there yet. All right, folks, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate that you hung out with me an extra 10 minutes, and I hope today was uh, of use to you. And uh, if you're interested in SSP, please let us know. I'd be happy to follow up with you. Unicon would be happy to follow up with you. And if you have additional questions, that research paper that we have would be a great place to start. You can go to studentsuccessplan.org, and it's linked from there, or drop me an email. And again, thank you so much for your time, and I hope today's session was useful to you, and I hope to talk to you in the future.